everyone. Thank you for joining us on this week's edition of the Master Instructor Roundtable. I'm Regional Master Instructor Marty Miller here with co-host Regional Master Instructor Miss Wendy Batts. Wendy, how's everything going today? That's great, Marty. How are you? Good. I'm excited for today's topic. Kind of, I guess you could say a little selfish. As you know, I've been experimenting, been playing with around adding yoga into the program, and we've talked about the different types. But I was in class the other day and I was watching how I was adjusting things, going through things, running the anatomy through my head. And I'm like, you know what? There might be a lot of little hidden secrets in some of these popular yoga poses that people may not realize that in my head, I'm like, that's corrective exercise. This is stabilization endurance. This would be great for this movement compensation. So instead of just talking about yoga uh, from a broad brush, I kind of want to dive deeper and talk about some of the poses that we see a lot. And maybe get people to look at them a little bit differently, look at it through an NESM lens, a functional anatomy lens, and maybe hopefully gives people some opportunity to maybe meet their clients where they're at. Because I'm telling you, there are a lot of yogis out there that you they don't want to have it taken away from them. We just maybe need to tweak it a little bit and maybe even put some yoga stuff back in for other people. Yes. And when you said you wanted to do this, I started laughing because as many of you guys know, I am terrible at yoga. <laughs> And I think it's mainly, I mean, I can hold the poses. I like the statics, but when it comes to flow and the things that I really want to get to do or, or you know, I want to do because it's more challenging, you got to know the basics first. And so when you were talking about some of these, these poses and, you know, and, and I do want to throw this out there, when you start to really dive deep into the model and you really look at people's posture and you're walking around in your day-to-day -day life, I'm telling you, we see it everywhere. Feet are turning out, people with big arches in their back, rounded shoulders. You're looking at how someone's pushing a cart at the grocery store, standing in line to pay for something. It's everywhere. And it is everywhere. And so the more that you start to notice these things, you can see the common compensations of muscles that are often overactive. And then obviously, the other side would be underactive. So when Marty started talking about some of these exercises that he wanted to bring forth today, I started laughing like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And then I actually tried some of them. I was successful, mind you. Um, however, to your point, Marty, when you were like, let's break it down, I would, I think this is a great idea. I think next time we should do a live like with you in your room downstairs and go through some of the poses. That's what I'm thinking. As I become one with myself. Yes, indeed. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so obviously I'm going to continue to use the term accidental exercise. And, and what I mean by that is you're going through and doing something. We've talked about sled push. We've talked about curved treadmills. There's a lot more going on. If you really dissect a lot of exercise, you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize I was sneaking this in, sneaking this in. Once you start looking at things that way, you can be even better with your program design. And Wendy, we've had people say, well, I can't get everything in. So in my mind, that's where I look for these accidental exercise type of things where I'm like, well, I'm getting this, 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 and this. So that's what we mean by accidental ex exercise. Then is yoga just yoga? We'll talk about that. Could it be part of phase one? Could it even be part of corrective exercise from the integration standpoint? And then hopefully we'll leave you with some takeaways that you can implement later today or tomorrow. I love it. So, of course, we have to talk about the definition when we say accidental. I mean, you know, when we're looking at it from an adjective perspective, we're talking about happening by chance, unintentional, unexpected, you know, that you're going to accidentally come upon something. And so, as Marty was saying, you know, I think it's important, especially when you look at something like yoga. I have so many clients that really need to work on their flexibility and they need some kind of motivation. They also like to do things in groups. So, for that particular individual, yoga is a really good suggestion for that, you know, that client if they can carve out, let's say, an hour of their time. Why? Because they're done in groups. You can do it with your friends. You're working on balance. So think about everything in the foot. And then you're also obviously getting flexibility um, in areas that are often overactive. And so when, that is all done by accident. They're going in for yoga. They're thinking they're becoming mindful, which, yes, that's a part of yoga. But there are so many benefits they go hand in hand with some of these patterns and movements. But I am also going to throw out it's very important to remember if you have something that is causing discomfort, low back pain, or there are certain areas where, you know, you have had strains or stresses in particular muscles, it, you need to be very careful and very, you know, um, you need to think about each movement 
and make sure it's an intentional movement just for what you can do when they tell you to go deeper or hold things longer and they're pushing you and you know it's pushing you to the limits that's not the time to push yourself past the limits because there are injuries that can happen and unfortunately i have seen that too so obviously you want to use caution and if there's particular things that you know are done in yoga that may not be beneficial for your clients you want to let them know that beforehand too yeah great points wendy and then coming back to accidental so let's look at someone working on the curved treadmill. They're doing it for cardio. They're doing it for other things. The accidental part comes into when you really look at the other benefits. So it may start off as accidental, but then it's purposeful once we start to program for it. Yes, of course. <laughs> Oh, the downward facing dog. All right. I'm going to talk about the different things that you're going to see on here. And Marty, I would love to know. Um, your thoughts about this particular exercise. Because if you're looking at this one picture, you're going to see this individual is able to put her hands, number one, flat on the floor. Okay, that for me is very challenging because the muscles in my hands get very tight um, because I use them so much when I'm doing some manual therapy, especially when I'm working with bigger individuals and athletes. And so to me, that's the first thing where I'm like, man, I'm a little jealous there, you know, just with that motion. So not only are you working things that are going on with the palms and we've talked, especially even in random fit about earthing yourself and grounding yourself. I think it's important to see that all four, um, you know, her hands and her feet are both grounded, but she's working on shoulder stability. There's scapular depression. You must have lumbar flexion. Um, and then of course, calf and hamstring flexibility and then thoracic extension. And I know in the very beginning in some of these classes, downward facing dog is one of those exercises that are done in the beginning of the courses a lot and then continuously brought back between each movement, especially if it is a flow type of class. So I've noticed personally when I've done this, my heels may not easily be on the ground to start, but by the end of the class, they are. And so it is interesting to see and, and mentally take a picture of how you feel at the start of class. And then how you feel at the end of class, because for me, especially this one, this one's a really good tell off for me. Yeah. And with downward facing dog, it's one of those resets that they do all the time. So you're going to be in it frequently. Then we could talk about the flow, getting up, getting down the transitions where, you know, I notice sometimes they'll have us go from down, uh, downward facing dog to something else like, Ooh, my hip isn't moving. There's an adductor magnus tightness or hip internal rotation. Right. But when you look at the downward facing dog, I love it because you, as you said, Wendy, you're grounded or it's a closed chain exercise for upper and lower body, which means if all four points are on the ground, we could have put core activation in here, right? Depends on where your hands are. So for me, the hands aren't the issue. It would be, I can't get that much lumbar flexion, right? I can't get <laughs> as far. Don't, why are you, I didn't laugh at you. Sorry. <laughs> Wow, everybody. I was so kind. And Wendy's laughing at me, but it's all good. It's all good. But yes, I'm getting better, Wendy. Next time you see me, I'm going to have a very good downward facing dog. But mine would be my restriction. And again, this is an assessment where the restriction comes from, right? Wendy's going to have issues uh, in her hands because of being a massage therapist and manual therapist. I have a restriction in my lumbar spine. So it once again, we say every exercise is an assessment. But what's really impressive to me here, all of us need more thoracic extension or almost all of us. And to look at that, look at where her spine is in line with her hips and look how her hands are out in front. And you can see that right where her sports bra would be, you can see that she's in extension, right? So she's not in hyper extension, but she's getting that. That would be your arms above your head in an overhead squat. A lot of people are restricted there. So you could be getting a pec stretch here. You could get all kinds of things. And then I push into the ground to activate my scapular depressors, things like that. So great exercise, great pose. And as you said, Wendy, this, you're going to be spending some time here and you will get better as the class progresses, but over time too. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of, and there's a lot of different progressions, of course, for downward facing dog. Mm -hmm. And you'll also notice too, if you are, you know, really looking at people's movement, I know one thing that I've noticed in these classes when this is done, how, how hard it is for people to keep their feet pointed forward. But then again, that also translates into everything we talk about during the assessments with the very common compensation, the feet turning out. And, um, and so for, for this person to really be almost in the five kinetic chain checkpoints, <laughs> 
but just in a bent position, um, you know, I find, I find it, I'm a little jealous actually, but. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you'll hold 30 seconds to a minute here and I, you know, I wear my Apple watch and you'll see the heart rate go up. So there's a lot of benefits to it for sure. Mm -hmm. Then we have tree pose. When do you want to start us off here? Okay. So tree pose, this is interesting because, um, I had a client and this true story that just started doing yoga and was terrible with balance, hated doing balance exercises with me, didn't see the purpose, but they were getting ready to turn 70. And so balance is a very, very important component, especially as we age. And we all know this. And um, so, you know, I spoke and, and that's what's really good about having relationships you know, and feeling comfortable and talking to different teachers. But I actually spoke to this private instructor that was working with this individual and let them know the areas that we struggled with. And it was being able to balance, really focusing a lot on the outer hip. And then also to saying that they had some weakness because of overactivity in the upper traps, the, the, um, and as well as the, uh, the neck. And so, over time, now this is, he's been participating in yoga for now four months, but over time, his balance has got, become so much better. He now actually is like excited to show me different things that he couldn't do before because they are working with, along with me and, and the assessment of saying, Hey, if we could do this and make him stronger here, he's going to be able to do this later on. And so, so it wasn't like we were fighting with each other, meaning teacher to teacher, we were really working collaboratively and, and it's showing in every movement that he's doing and his confidence now on all the balance things that we're doing has gotten, you know, better. So therefore the exercises can be more challenging. And so when he's working with me, we can do things harder now than, than before when he started doing that. With all that being said, tree pose is one of the things he shows me more than anything. And it's mainly because when you think about this, look what he's doing with the hip. He's got to put his hands over his head. So therefore you've got to think, um, Think about levers and how he's having to extend his lever. He's really having to squeeze his, uh, in this particular picture, it would be the left glute and really thinking about the extension and the lat. But then also it's really about the foot, being able to really control the arch and, and build those muscles within the foot. Um, I find this one to be great. Yeah. And when he, so many great points there. The other thing too is yoga, you're going to be there for an hour right? Generally speaking, I haven't seen a class yet uh, that I've done that's under an hour. Sometimes they go a little bit longer. So the volume of activity you're going to get, the frequency through a lot of these poses is there, which is great. The other thing too, is your barefoot, right? We always talk about being barefoot and the value of it. You don't get to do that in a lot of fitness centers. They won't allow you, or it just isn't part of the training. So now getting those deep intrinsic foot muscles to be stronger, it's phenomenal. Then also you've got the breathing at the same time here with this. So I, I love it. And then what I also like about tree pose is you're sometimes getting this in a little bit more of a fatigue state. Now, does it, no, everyone's a little bit different, but you know, if you go through a harder flow class and they're doing this as towards the end of class, you really got to mentally stay focused, which they do a great job of in these classes. But now you've got to also have your balance when you are a little fatigued, sometimes they'll do them at the beginning, which would be like our activation. So it's one of those things that is forced upon you in class. Uh, it's like, it's sometimes in their resistance training program, they want to get right to the other stuff, but in yoga, you're going to get a lot of it. So I, I love it. And then there's different transitions into and out of this pose. So it's, it's great. And like you said, it's something that uh, gets much more going on with the glutes, the upper extremities than people may think. Yes. And transitioning does not mean falling out, just so you know. <laughs> oh, no, graceful guidance and gliding. And oh, connection. very graceful. Just graceful. very graceful. That's all me. <laughs> and today on the Master Instructor Roundtable, myself, Wendy Batts, is, is here with my friend and co-host, Marty Miller. And we're talking about accidental exercises when we're thinking about yoga and not just yoga in general, but really kind of diving a little bit deep into some of these poses. Obviously, we've talked about the downward dog. We then talked about the tree pose. And then, Marty, why don't we talk about the pigeon pose? So why don't you? That's, that's a great yeah. picture. He looks yeah, very that's, confident that, in himself. I was, right was going to put my picture in there, but, you know, I just couldn't get the quality of shot. Um, and mine doesn't look like that yet. But the tree, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, yo the 
pigeon pose, I should say, is definitely one I'm working on. And it really comes down to hip mobility. So we've got it. Now, this is kind of cool, right? Because we talk about asymmetrical shifts in NASM. Now, this is something where you're doing totally different things on one side of the body versus the other. And you, again, will, from an assessment standpoint, be able to see there's going to be a lot of differences in one side of your body versus the other. So if we're looking at this gentleman's front leg, he's got that in that figure four. First and foremost, you'll see how nice his knee is actually laying on the ground. A lot of times somebody's knee will be elevated. It won't have that ability just to, to lay flat. And you can see he's in a relaxed position. He's not holding his breath. He's not struggling here. So sometimes they'll use um, aids and guides of other ways to get around it. But when you look at that front leg, he's definitely getting some good hip capsule mobility. And Gentlemen, I think we all need to, to address this right now that a lot of us are going to be very restricted in the hip capsules. And this is what happens when you can't get into a deep squat. This is what happens when you're doing certain exercise and you just feel that tightness. So this is a great mobilization for the hip capsule on the front leg. You're also going to get piriformis. So if you have that overactivity in the piriformis, you're going to see that there. Then if we we're to look at his back leg or his right leg, Depending on how flexible you are, if you can rotate your femur all the way over, you're going to get primarily just hip flexors. But in the position that he's in right there, you're getting adductors and hip flexor at the same time. As we know, there are hip flexors that do adduction, so this is great. But you get a, a ton right there. Now, some of the progressions on pigeon, you're going to see them fall lean, you know, gracefully fall forward into that <laughs> front leg and then actually put in some rotation. So this... It, position uh, here is the starting position, but some of those more advanced, they could lie their chest towards their knee. Some people can get completely on their knee and then they would rotate further uh, towards away from that left leg and get some thoracic rotation. Then if they have the extensibility in the upper extremity, they can get even lats in there. So for some of us, I might go down to my forearms. That's about where I'm at right now. And then I start to notice compensation. So pigeon pose is something that I've started to put into my morning mobility program uh, because it's just hard to get uh, good mobility in that hip capsule without doing something similar to this. And I will say too, you know, I, I said in the very beginning that there's um, some people that have complained about when they've gone into yoga that sometimes, especially if they have some low back issues that, um, you know, when they take some of the yoga classes that they feel like it, it kind of lights them up. And so when you're doing things like Cobra or even in this particular position with, with pigeon, I always tell them, don't try to get your torso then so far forward. You know, like you can see he's sitting up very, I mean, he's great. He's got the ability to do that. He's got the flexibility and the mobility. However, again, we want to think about, we want mobility in the thoracic spine more so than in the lumbar spine. So if you know that you've got an area where an anterior tilt is happening, there's compression in the lumbar spine you know, in the lumbar spine with the disc, then just lean forward. Again, think about, you know, the, the same, you know, lines. Um, and, and we did that, Marty, I tell people instead of doing this, actually go onto the forearm. So therefore you're putting yourself in a, in a more of a neutral spine, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, and then just do what you can. You want to try to think this is amazing for the hips, like you even said, and it's going to help with the lumbar spine long-term if you've got more mo mobility in the area of your hips, because therefore the hips are moving and not putting so much stress on the lumbar spine. So you want to think too, what's the safest for yourself? What's the safest for your clients? But just like every exercise we've ever talked about, have regressions and progressions, give them things to think about, especially if you know that, you know, they're, they could be predisposed to doing something that might um, cause even more discomfort, get them out of it before they even go to class. Right. Yeah. I mean, I hit the foam roller beforehand, do it, you know, if I can get, I even do some mobility in my hips even prior to class, but yeah, I totally agree with you. But this is, this is one of the ones I'm like, I'm going to get this pose. Like it's going to get there. Cause I can tell it's not an anatomical block. It's just, I need to get more range of motion in my hip flexors and my hip capsules. So I get it here. So this is on my bucket list to one day, I'm going to show you a picture of me sitting like that. Oh, the airplane pose. So, you know, this guys, I think is an unbelievable exercise for people that really want to um, take their Romanian deadlift to another level. If you're looking at it on a resistance side, but also too, you've got to think now you're changing. I mean, obviously look at the levers, look at the resistance, look at um, how you are against gravity. 
I think it's unbelievable for the foot and ankle complex. I mean, that to me is where I feel this one the most when I do this. Obviously, we want to make sure that the, we remain neutral within the spine. So it's unbelievable for core stabilization. If you are really doing this correctly, you want to make sure that you're working your, you know, the, the muscles that cause shoulder, shoulder depression, retraction, and external rotation, which we know, especially when um, as a common compensation, we've got rounded shoulders and forward head. So maintaining good neutral position. But you're also, with your hands being that way, you're having to activate your mid to lower trap, which we also know are commonly weak muscles. So if somebody can do a single leg Romanian deadlift, they can do it with a lot of weight, give them lighter weight, and now have them try to go into the airplane pose, but maybe even with slower motion or going with balance and see how much more difficult that is. But you also want to make sure when you're doing this, you're remaining neutral within the spine and that you're not opening up the hip and turning at this point until, again, that might be something that's more advanced. They can turn and then open up into internal and external rotation of the hip capsule. So try neutral first, and then you can add some of the rotational movements. And uh, I find this one as an activation standpoint to be unbelievable. Yeah. And for me, what I like about it is a lot of times we'll transition in from warrior into the airplane pose. So you're getting that movement, having to decelerate your body, even though it's coming out of a, a very slow controlled pose, it's not like we're just setting up always into the airplane pose. So, you know, there's a whole nother component to it because you went through all the key points there, but yeah, I will feel my foot and you're staring right down at it and the sweat's dripping and you can see those muscles right working, which is great. But as you're saying too, you can do the rotation. So for me, I have to have a block, you know, for me to stay in my five connect chain checkpoints, I can put a block on the ground brace with my left hand. And then, sorry, we got a special guest coming in and then I can start doing the rotation. So that again, to me is, is a, a great addition to it for sure. Is your special guest meatball? Yep. He's up there. He's trying to make his guest appearance <laughs> on the master instructor round table. So and I got to talk to his agent. Clearly, he doesn't understand, uh, you know, etiquette. <laughs> oh, Marty, I'm going to let you take this one. Warrior one, two, and humble warrior. I think I'm more of a humble warrior personally, but go ahead. <laughs> well, if you look at it, there's three poses right here. So, yeah, here he is again. So we're going to continue this this game here with today with Meatball. So there he is. He's made his <laughs> best instructor roundtable appearance. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you get when you're going live and you got pets. So with warrior one, you can see there, it's much more sagittal plane based, right? I'm going to get my hip flexor on the back leg. You're getting again, that lat and pec, you know, getting the upper extremities engaged. And then from there, you know, you're going to spend some time there. They have you stay there. And then a lot of times you'll transition right into warrior two. So now we move into the frontal plane. And now you're getting a lot more adductor, but you're isolating and you're holding on that front leg. So when we talk about isometrics, we're getting great work in that isometrics that we talk about with NASM that are so important and really focus on getting into the right depth. So whether it's the warrior one or warrior two, you're getting the activation of the glutes. And then what I do just a little change with warrior two is I come up into external rotation and a little retraction because that's what I need to work on, but there's nothing wrong with maintaining your position there. And now you're getting a lot of isometric work in the shoulders and people generally don't have the muscular endurance in their shoulders. So it's a great way to activate all of those muscles that stabilize within the shoulder without having to load it. And then humble warrior is an interesting one. You're going to get a lot of adductor magnus on the front leg. You're going to get your hip flexor on the back leg. And then now let's look at his back leg. Look at that toe extension. Wendy, I know when you jump in here, you're going to love that, that first MTP joint. But then for us here that are a little more restricting the upper body, you're supposed to hopefully be able to clasp your hands and then bring your arms towards the ceiling. So you're getting pec stretch for sure, but now you're also getting post to your chain activation. And when you're holding that position for 20 to 30 seconds, you're getting all those things done in an isometric manner. So humble warrior is another great one. That's kind of not really discussed from all the corrective exercise that could be going on. Yes. I mean, you were actually just, you, you said it. I mean, that's one of the reasons when, when this one's being done, you know, that, that I really like, because again, working that 
first MTP joint, guys, remember that's your propeller. That's a joint that is often restricted, which is the, the big toe joint. No one thinks about the toes, but you really want good mobility within that first, um, you know, big toe. So therefore, when you're walking, you're you're pushing yourself off. If you're working with professional athletes, that's one of the things, especially if they're running and jumping, which is pretty much every athlete. Um, that is a very important joint that is often neglected. I mean, we we do often really emphasize the importance of dorsiflexion and having 20 degrees of that. However, don't forget the big toe. And I think we want what 70 degrees of, of, yeah. um, of extension. So, so if you know that you're lacking some big toe extension, try this one and, and uh, also how hard try, it is. Yeah, exactly. Great point. And even if you look at warrior two here in the center, if you look at this individual's, it would be their right leg. If you're real, they, they do a great job of cueing to get the arch in your foot. So think of the perineal, Mm -hmm. um, that I'm stretching right there. A lot of people are very tight in their perineals. So even in warrior two there, and then in warrior one, they are great at, at telling you to create that arch. So you're getting a lot of that intrinsic, uh, work done, but then simultaneously you're stretching the lateral gastroc and the perineal simultaneously. So totally yeah, yeah. love these three. <laughs> and it's got a cool name. I'm a guy like, we'll like warrior. <laughs> Oh, child's pose. So child's pose is a position that my clients absolutely love. And after we get done working out or even after, you know, they get off the table, this is a pose where they just want to go to. And I think it's great. You're getting an unbelievable lat stretch. And think about the reason being is where the lats attach in the in the lumbar spine. So basically, you're, you're really getting a good stretch there. You're going into a posterior pelvic tilt, which is what you want to do when you're stretching the lat, then you're reaching forward. So you're getting really good extensibility. Start in the middle, then I have them walk side to side. So therefore they're going to go to the left and go to the right. So therefore they're going to get more emphasis on the left stretch, um, left lat versus the right um, lat and then vice versa when we move. Again, really good um, stretch when you're thinking about lumbar flexion um, and then thoracic extension. So I love this one. It's also a good time just to kind of refocus, reset your mind. And then at that point, start your day. Um, and this is something that I have my clients who really struggle in the morning. Um, my older clients that struggle getting out of bed. I'll just tell them before you get out of bed, roll over, do the child's pose, kind of stay there for a few minutes and then try to roll back over and get out of bed and start your day. <laughs> Can't argue that. But no, the child's pose is great. It's a reset a lot in the flows. But this is phenomenal for me for my lumbar flexion, for sure. And then lats. So this is something I do every day in my own, even prior to jumping into yoga. I think everybody knew child's pose if you've even never taken a yoga class. So this is, a, without a doubt, a staple in my daily routine, regardless whether I'm taking a yoga class or not. Well, and, and I want to also say with the client that I mentioned before, the one that was um, you know starting this yoga class. One of the things we really struggled with was he could not get into plantar flexion very easily. Like, so when he got into this position, he could not rest his foot flat onto the floor without cramping in the arch of his foot. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there was a lot of things going on. Now he can, but it is amazing to see when somebody starts in a yoga class, or even if you're working with your clients, can they even like, you know, have their, their glutes sit on their heels? Can they do that without cramping? And it's, it's actually very interesting to see, especially as they age, that is a very common complaint, the, the cramp in the arch of the foot. Right. No, I think yoga is great for that, especially when you're working on those deep intrinsic stabilizers of the foot as well. Mm-hmm. Key takeaways. Well, you know, are you strategically utilizing accidental exercises? And if not, you should stay tuned because Marty and I talk about all kinds of accidental exercises almost every time we, we have one of these uh, podcasts. Um, and then I really do believe that yoga can be such a really important part of programming. All my basketball players, they professional athletes are going to take yoga, guys. They take yoga. They need that extensibility, flexibility. They, you know, we're working on strength. They knew that mobility is a huge part of that because remember, you're only as strong as you are stable and you're only as powerful as you are strong. So hence the model. And then again, think about flexibility, muscle activation, isometric, isometric strength, and then, and then yoga, that kind of yoga is pretty much the definition of all of that. And, you know, just be mindful of your movement pattern, which is what yoga is all about. And really just think about your positioning know what your, your restrictions are and work in areas that are going to be best for you. Couldn't agree more, Wendy. Absolutely. Um, so glad that I've added it into my schedule. 
try to get at least one or two a week. Good for you, Marty. <laughs> Doing my best. Doing my best. Um, so if you have any questions for me, you can feel free to email me at wendy.bats at nasm.org. And if you want to find me on Instagram, you can find me at wendy.bats13. And Marty, how can they find you and Meatball? Yep. So Meatball, our special guest this week, you can uh, get a hold of him through me at dr.martymiller72. And my email is marty.miller at nasm.org. So you know, didn't know we were going to have a special guest this week, but, you know, it is what it is. That's me. It's great to see him. He, yes. He's looking great. <laughs> he is. He is. He's, if you know, he's struggling with a heart condition, but he's doing his stuff. He's, he's, he's doing his thing. So on we go. <laughs> well, well, guys, thank you guys so much for joining us today on the Master Instructor Roundtable. We look forward to seeing you guys next week. So until next time, take care and be well.